Before we move on to current events, it's vital to know how we got here. I will now present an extremely shortened version of recent U.S. monetary history. The purpose of this section is to show you that the U.S. government has radically shifted the rules during times of emergency, and that our monetary system is really a lot younger than you might think. After the panic of 1907, when private banker J.P. Morgan intervened as the lender of last resort, banks began agitating for a government solution. What was finally decided upon in 1913 was a federally sponsored cartel called the Federal Reserve, which sounded governmental, but really was not. The stock of the Federal Reserve was to be held by its member banks, not the U.S. government, nor the public, which remains the case today. So what we call the Federal Reserve actually is a federally sponsored banking cartel, licensed to lend money into existence. By the 1930s, a federally reserve-fueled speculative bubble had burst, resulting in numerous bank failures, which shrank the money supply by nearly a third in three years. Despite being chartered as a lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve failed to halt a catastrophic banking collapse. In 1933, newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt decided to counter the falling money supply in a most drastic manner. To accomplish this, he confiscated all privately held gold and immediately devalued the U.S. dollar. Prior to the seizure, it took approximately $21 to buy an ounce of gold, and afterwards, it took $35. Soon after, contractual obligations of the U.S. government, such as bonds payable in gold, were nullified with the approval of the Supreme Court. This goes to show how governments in a period of emergency can change rules and break their own laws. All of the seized gold either ended up in the vaults of the Federal Reserve or at the International Monetary Fund or on the books of the Federal Reserve. A grand total of $11 billion was exchanged for all 261 million ounces of the nation's gold. In other words, complete control of the gold supply of the most powerful and prosperous nation on Earth was exchanged for $11 billion printed out of thin air creating some very serious storage hardships for the Federal Reserve. I mean, have you ever tried lifting 70-pound gold bricks that high over your head? In any event, to end the turmoil of depression and war and to provide a foundation for global recovery, a conference was held at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944, with all the major Allied powers attending. Recognizing that the U.S. then represented nearly half of the global economy, the U.S. dollar was made the global reserve currency. All other currencies had fixed rates of exchange to the dollar, which in turn was redeemable for gold at $35 per ounce. The Bretton Woods II system ushered in a period of prosperity and rapid economic recovery. But there was a flaw in the system. Nothing in the Bretton Woods Agreement prevented the U.S. Federal Reserve from expanding the supply of Federal Reserve notes. As this happened, the gold backing behind each dollar steadily declined, such that there was not enough gold to back all of the dollars. Meanwhile, as the Vietnam War intensified, the U.S. was running budget deficits and flooding the world with paper dollars. The French, under President Charles de Gaulle, became suspicious that the U.S. would be unable to honor its Bretton Woods obligations to redeem their excess dollars into gold. As the French exchanged their surplus dollars for gold, the U.S. Treasury's gold stocks declined alarmingly. Finally, President Nixon declared force majeure on August 15, 1971, and slammed the gold window ending its dollar convertibility. That's what governments do during wartime, and the U.S. followed the pattern perfectly. But this time, it affected the whole world because the removal of gold convertibility of the dollar destroyed the foundation of the Bretton Woods system. Without a gold backing, there was no hard physical limit to how many paper dollars could be issued. Since we now know that all dollars are backed by debt, what do you suppose happened to U.S. debt levels once the externally applied rigor of gold was removed? Let's find out. This is a chart of U.S. federal debt from the period of 1949 to 2004. Note that it looks like any other exponential chart we've already reviewed, but especially note that the graph turns the corner shortly after Nixon slammed the gold window. That is, when Nixon removed the last vestige of external physical restraint from the system. And also note how rapidly the debt levels have climbed recently. These past few years have seen the highest and most rapid accumulation of federal debt in our entire history thanks in large measure to an experiment never before attempted in our country's history, the conduct of two foreign wars and a tax cut at the same time. This rapid accumulation of debt is not a mysterious process at all. Rather, it's an entirely predictable consequence of the slamming of the gold window. How much longer can this continue? Unfortunately, there's no good answer to this besides, as long as foreigners let us, 
A second, predictable and related consequence concerns the total amount of money in circulation. Remember, all money is loaned into existence, so the shape of the federal debt chart should tip you off to the shape of this next chart of U.S. money from the years 1959 to 2007. The first thing we can note here is that it took our country over 300 years from the very first pilgrim until 1973 to generate our first trillion dollars of money stock. Every road, every bridge, every marketplace on every corner of every town, every boat, and every building from the first colony until 1973 required a trillion dollars of money stock. Our most recent trillion dollars? That was created in the last four and a half months. My questions to you are these. What will it be like to live here when our nation is creating a trillion dollars every four weeks? How about every four days? What about every four hours? Four minutes? Where does this stop if not in hyperinflation and the destruction of the dollar, and by extension, our nation? If we view these events on a timeline, we can see that the Federal Reserve was formed in 1913, and that only 20 years later, in 1933, our country had entered a form of bankruptcy and had turned over its collective gold supply under force of law to the Federal Reserve. Eleven years after that, the U.S. dollar was enshrined as the world's reserve currency with an explicit backing by gold that was unilaterally removed by Nixon 27 years later. In effect, the current global monetary system of unbacked currencies is now only 37 years old. It was not planned, but simply emerged out of a crisis. The unredeemable U.S. dollar remains a popular reserve currency as a matter of convenience, but nothing requires or guarantees that it will retain this role. Only the U.S. is able to use its eroding reserve currency status to borrow and print dollars to pay for its trade deficits. However, as the dollar loses its reserve currency status from this abuse, the U.S. will be forced to either export more to pay for its imports or to take on ever heavier levels of debt. If these actions cause the dollar to keep falling, other countries will be tempted to devalue their currencies to keep pace and remain competitive. The potential for an inflationary period is evident, which brings us to the next section.